Okay, we'll call the uh, Maplewood Heritage Preservation Commission meeting to order for June 10, 2021. All uh, commissioners are here. That's good. And do we, uh, so note that on the roll call. Approval agenda, any changes to the agenda or any additions? Anyone? Okay, we'll take the agenda as it's printed. Approval of the minutes. Look at the minutes for May 13th. Is there approval of the minutes? I'll approve the minutes. Make a second. motion to approve. I'll give a second. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we're gonna Note that we're in the uh, Hazelwood Fire Station. Chief Lucan, is that the real title of this place? It is, sir. Hazelwood Fire Station, is is that your number seven? <laughs> when it originally started, we were 170. Each station had a different number based on our dispatchers down okay. there. And so this was actually 170. 170, okay. All right, so the reason for the meeting being here is we're gonna give a little tour of this building will be raised or demolished in a month or two and a new fire station will be added by the city. And we're fortunate to have uh, some people other than the commission members here. Uh, Chief Lucan is now retired but he's helping out and uh, Mike Sable is the staff member, the assistant commission, the si assistant city manager and uh, staff person for our commission. Okay, minutes are approved, new business. Hazelwood North Fire Station Tour, Chief Lucan. Well, I'll just, I'll kick it off and I'll wait for Kevin to kind of turn the camera, but this is a, a, a moment of change in the city of Maplewood. The fire station that you're in right now has got about three weeks of a useful life left and then they're gonna knock it down and rebuild a new station here a modern station that can accommodate sleeping quarters, administrative offices, community meeting spaces, a little historical nook so we can put historical artifacts from the fire department here. And it, uh, the, the folks at home can't see this, but there are three garage doors here, uh, a fourth one in the back. There's going to be seven doors on the new fire station for all of the new apparatus. It is a bigger, more modern, uh, it's going to be a beautiful station, um, and so but this group has an important piece to document history and to kind of tell the story, and so uh, we invited Chief Lucan, who is a 43-year veteran of the service and a neighbor of this station, a uh, longtime Maple resident, and I thought it was important that we invite him in to tell a little bit about what the transition looks like. And what I would really like to see is for folks to ask lots of questions because he can't go anywhere. We got a captive audience. <laughs> he knows a lot. Let's take advantage of his uh, knowledge. So, uh, Chief, I appreciate you being willing to kind of come in. Happy to do it. And uh, thanks for being a neighbor close by. Uh, what can you tell us about this station and, and kind of this, the history of the Maplewood uh, Fire Department and its kind of evolution? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, originally, there were three independent fire departments within the city of Maplewood. Uh, one was the Gladstone Fire Department, which was the original, and then the East County Line, which was down on Century Avenue, down towards the south a little ways, and then there was Parkside Fire Department, so those three independent. So at the time, the Gladstone Station was handling all the way up to our north boundary line, which was basically County Road D, and then the same distance uh, east and, or excuse me, yeah, east and west. Well, over time, this got built up more and more, and they just could no longer manage it out of one station down there to do that. So then they decided and went to the city council. So at first, this was the first fire station the city ever owned. All the other three in stations were actually owned by the independent fire departments. So when this was built, this was built with a, 
uh, a uh, group of people, firefighters in the city, to get this put together. As you can see, we only had three bays when we did it. Nowhere did we think we would end up where we are today, with the people in the area, with the way the mall's been built up, with the medical facilities that have grown. So probably this station is probably usefulness for the last 10 years has been pretty tough even to, to work out of here. So. At that point then, in 74, they decided they were going to build a fire station. And actually in 73, they started recruiting folks up in this area to become volunteer firefighters. And so at that point then, they were training and making calls with the Gladstone Department to get a better idea how to do things until this opened up. And when this opened up, they moved up here. They didn't start, and, and Gladstone assisted them with calls for about the first year. Then after that, they were totally independent here on themselves. And that's really what we had here. I actually became a member in 1977. So this is where I started. This was my home base and all the way on through and until obviously uh, my office moved from one location to the next. And, um, but this has been a great station. It served the community up here very, very well. Um, it probably, and I, you know, I don't want to be quoted on this, but I, I would say it was probably early, um, maybe 90s, uh, that the run volume between Gladstone and the Hazelwood Station up here really started to get closer and closer together. And then about 2000, this station was the busiest station throughout the whole city. And um, so it, it, really, it really was centrally located for that aspect of it. And a lot of calls, a lot of, a lot of good people were through here. We had some great chiefs, some great firefighters that went through here. Um, and being that old as it was, and some of those folks that started weren't as young as I was, you know, were in their 30s and so at the time. Uh, many of them have long since passed and uh, we lost a lot of history out of a lot of those folks. I appreciate that. Um, Commission members, do you have any questions about kind of the history of the fire service or the, the usefulness of this building? So we can also talk about the future too. So I'll open it up to the group. Well, I'll, I'll ask uh, Chief Lucan. So the mall was built in about 1970 or so? 69, I think it was started open, and I believe in 70 or 71. Okay, so then this came after the mall was built. A little built. bit after the mall, yep. Actually, where the mall was in that whole area was a big sand pit. A lot of us, when we were younger, used to play up in there and actually ride our mini bikes and all that stuff up there. And um, yeah, so it wasn't too far after that that was open that this station was, was built. And that was part of the reason, too, was what they felt was coming into that area. Oh yeah, because we took uh, everything north of County Road C and gave it to you, to Hazelwood over here. Yeah, so when the boundaries were, re were redone when we did this, basically Parkside used to go all the way to the end, around the lake a little bit, up Arcade a little bit, and at that point then we took it, everything north of County Road C and everything east, excuse me, yeah, east of uh, Highway 61 became ours and Parkside still covered that little corner. Actually where Bob lives now is that area is still covered, was still covered by uh, Parkside. Okay, anything else? I got a question about, you were talking about, there was in the beginning of three fire stations, it's all independent. Now, how was that formed? Did people just... Yep, actually, um, I, I, I can't explain exactly how the other, well, Parkside came because the area that they were in and they decided, but how Gladstone came about was is, is that city of St. Paul at the time, we were the little ta Canada township, and St. Paul was actually covering a lot of this area. And they actually came to, to at that time, to Little Tanner, the township, and said, we can't cover it anymore. We don't have the people. We don't have the equipment to come this far out. And we were getting not horribly busy, but busier. You know, a lot of grass fires, those types of things. So at that point then, there was a group of, Al, Shal, uh, Al uh, Shilla was one of the first. They went around and they started collecting some money, felt that they needed to put up a fire station. They started collecting money from the residents and doing certain booyahs and other types of things. There were dances and actually got the money that they needed and built that station pretty much by themselves, the old Gladstone station that was torn down in about 2000. Mm -hmm. And so that was the original. Uh, the police station was kind of attached to it a little bit for a while as it was built in there. The park and rec went in there for a little while. 
And so that's basically how it started. Then East County Line put their department together, kind of the same way as well as Parkside did. So Park those were the three independent yeah. things. Parkside went from, uh, because they were part of Little Canada, and they, and they went, the neighbors went around and collected money in that neighborhood too. Little, little, Parkside started when the city, when we became the city of Maplewood, is when actually yeah. when Parkside started. How do they keep on running? I mean, it costs money once they're built. Yep, so well that, that's a very good question. And how it was done is each year, um, each independent department would submit a budget to the, to the city at the time and then the city would come back and help fund it. Okay. And so what we would do is our equipment for many, many, many years, actually up until probably about 2000 or about 97, um, all of that money that we would get, we'd hold on to it, we'd, we'd do it, we'd go out and, and uh, do uh, like big dinners, dances, you know, collect. And um, then that money was used to buy the equipment. We owned everything at that time. It wasn't until about 95, the city of Maplewood then bought the first actual fire truck, and that was a ladder truck or a snorkel truck that they bought, which was kept down at the Gladstone Station, but that was actually owned by uh, the city of Maplewood. Okay. Are all the stations now owned by the city of Maplewood? Pardon me? Are all the stations now owned by the city of Maplewood? Yes. Yep. Th yep. That started when this station was built, and again, about, about 74, and then uh, the city owned this, and then... Uh, boy, don't quote me on this, but I want to say in the late 70s, early 80s, the station in the very south end became part of, uh, of the East County Line one, and that was the other station that they owned. So the city only owned, what's that? I think that was 79 for me. Could have been yeah. 79 or 80, yeah. And that was where the only two stations the city owned. And it wasn't until 97 when we consolidated into the Maplewood Fire Department that they owned all of them. How many trucks were stationed there? We actually had two trucks here. We had what we called a rescue truck and an engine, which was our first engine out for firefighting. And then back in the early 70s, when the Maplewood Police Department went to a paramedic program, the ambulances were kept here, and then the, the, the volunteers or paid for call folks brought that ambulance to the calls, and the medics stayed in their vehicles. So you only had one truck station here? Two trucks. We had a rescue truck, which is also a pumper, so you could do okay. dual things now. But we still, at the time, there was no way we could do it all ourselves, so we still... Um, would have Gladstone come and we had mutual aid with Parkside and East County Line so that we, we always had more than just one or two trucks. Well, how many calls on average would you have in a week or a day? Or... Well, I can only, I can only take a rough guess because it changed quite quickly, but I would say when I started in 77, we probably averaged four to five calls a week and today we're over 7,000 calls. Okay. So, and that was probably, and that was and that's 7,000 annually. Right? Yeah, annually, oh, annually, yeah, not a week, I'm sorry, yeah. I should have I done that, yeah. So, so, yeah, it was because I remember when I first started, we were getting paid about 50 cents a call, and we got, didn't get paid by the hour, by the call, so if the call six, took six hours, we still got 50 cents. So, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't about the money, it was about the camaraderie and about providing and giving back to the community you lived in. That was the key for almost everyone who was ever a volunteer or paid for call firefighter. And there was also the other side of it was the fact that you had to have the love for the work you were doing. Because every day you went to a call, you put your life on the line. And back then we didn't have anywhere near the kind of safety stuff that we have today to do that. So yeah, so again too, it was, uh, you know, we averaged probably a year, maybe 120 calls somewhere in that neighborhood, you know. So how many people were actually stationed here? Okay, so we averaged, we tried to keep about 30 of them here all the time, but I say our average was around 26 because they would come and go, you know, to do that. We, we, when we were at 30 to 32 firefighters, we were doing very, very well. And early on, it was easy to do that. The training wasn't as extensive. Um, they, we, as many of you may remember, some of you are young enough probably don't, at some point our workforce used to have a day shift, an afternoon shift, and an evening shift. You know, that 11 to 7 in the morning. They would actually come here to stay Nope, here? that was their work days. They worked. So when those guys that worked at night, the daytime guys covered the night, and then during the day when the daytime guys were working, the guys that worked at 11 to 7 midnight shift, they were covering the daytime calls. And so it, it worked out, but as time went along, that night shift got smaller and smaller. So our day shift, you know, people who could respond got even smaller and smaller. And that started to put a pretty heavy, significant drain on the departments. Is most everybody full-time now? 
We've been full time since 2016. Okay. Yeah. When you were, you know, all volunteer, how far was there a limit? How far people could live away? You know, at the time we didn't, but as time went on, we did have to do that. Um, so what we basically said is, is that we liked that five minute response time. So if you lived five minutes away from the station, those were the folks we were really looking for. If you were 10 minutes out, we didn't say no to that either because you would get there. You might not make the first truck you were on, but you would get there for the second truck if needed, or you would be there even a little later and you would be the standby for any other calls that might come in. So there wasn't that. And then as time got on, we went as far out as 20 minutes to try to get folks at, you know, later, later in the development of the department. Got harder and harder to get Exactly. And then, of course, eventually the night shift went away totally. And even the afternoon shift, that 3 to 11 shift, started, you know, kind of going away a little bit too. So it was harder and harder to get folks. Yeah, see, we, we ended up, we were allowed, four, what was it, 45. Each station was allowed so many guys in it. We had 45. We tried to keep 20 slots for the day side. And... We averaged probably 15. We kept a few, but I remember some of the Hazelwood guys says, heck, you can get three, three trucks out, empty your station before we get one truck out of here. That was a uh, heller. And again, it depended how close you lived to the station, how fast you got there, and how fast you could get the truck out. Who's taken the protection for this area when this goes down. All the trucks are gone, they're someplace else. Yep, it's all coming out of station two, the one that's in Gladstone there, right behind. I always, everybody, anytime I ever ask, they ask me where the station is, it's easy to say, do you know where the Maplewood Bakery is? I don't think I've ever yeah. had a soul <laughs> who hasn't told me they don't know where the Maplewood Bakery is, uh. ever. And so, yeah, it's right behind there, and that the staff that was here has moved down there, all the equipment's there, and so we're running that out of that area. So they get a longer run to get over in this area? A little bit, but actually when we did the study in, uh, by a professional group that came in, it was less than a half of a half percent difference in response time. Okay. That's why when the new station is built, what is there is all coming up here as well. From that station? Yep, that station will be closed and will be down to two stations. What are they going to do with that station? Uh, that, I don't know yet. That's something more Mike's end of it for those guys <laughs> to figure out how they're going to get rid of it. You know, we've talked to some folks who, you know, giving them some thoughts and might be interested in it, but as far as I know, there's been nothing in stone yet. But. It's a redevelopment opportunity in a, in a nice area for lots of things. Well, that's a nice area for a historical museum <laughs> of stuff. Yeah. The old police vehicles, yeah, old there's fire. A, there's a model for how to build a building. It's a lot of dinners and... Yeah, but we have, the, we have the building. We don't need it. We got it. You just open the door, drag the stuff in. Okay, Mike, are we going to do anything else with the, uh, with the fire station? Here? Well, I think it might be helpful to kind of get a sense for what it's like to live in there and, you know, kind of be so we'll do a quick little tour of the inside. It'll be a little bit cooler. We'll leave the camera here because it's it's too hard to carry it and follow it. So, um, but we'll let the chief kind of talk about it. And then when we're inside, we can also talk about what it's going to look like when the new station is here. What is the timeline for that? Uh, so Tear this, the, build the new. The demolition should begin. I'm predicting the week of July 5th. That's what the plan. So quickly. So it'll be coming down very quickly. There's just a few things to kind of get out of here, and then uh, construction will be very fast. Uh, so the exterior shell of the building will probably be done by late October, and then they come and work inside, and so we hope to have the, and I, you know, uh, there's always a construction timeline schedule, but um, second quarter of 2022, it'll be up and running. That's the plan, yep. yep. Yeah. Is there a plan to document the destruction and Yes. Video, so, camera. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so we, we have been, and I know Mike's been working with, with uh, Kevin and those that they're going to do some of that. We even talked about at one point putting up one of those cameras that does that fast oh, type sure. of thing. Now, whether we'll get to that or not, I don't know. But yes, we will do a lot of that. The same thing we did when we took down the Gladstone station. Okay. We took a lot of pictures and a lot of videos. That stuff came down. 
And drone technology really helps us. So I, I showed the video of the, we did the drone footage of what this looks like today. Uh, and we're gonna do that periodically throughout the construction process. So we can kind of see from a bird's eye view what that looks like. Because it's gonna be a, right? I mean, it's gonna stand out. It's right. gonna be a beautiful building. How are you gonna feel when the bulldozer hits the building and down she comes? You know, it, it, it's gonna be hard, but I've been through it all to where we yeah. are today and been a, just, Till I retired, was actually active with Chief Mondor on, you know, starting the new one, and um, I'm excited about where we're going to be in the future and what it's looking sure. like, and the kind of service we're going to continue to be able to provide to our cu our customers. I mean, that's what this was all about. We just couldn't continue to do it out of here the way we have, and so we the, the council understood that as well as the city manager and Mike, and uh, it was it was it's been a great uh, process and a great uh, partnership with everybody. I'm just curious. This is located in an area with a lot of residential. Do you have any problems if you have a lot of trucks going in and out and sirens going on? Yep, so earlier on, we, if you guys remember, if any of you remember, you know what the tornado siren sounds like. Well, in order to get the folks to the fire station, we, we had little pagers, but even at the very beginning, it was a call tree. Uh, just to digress a little bit, so when Gladstone started, there used to be Benson's store that was right where Mike's LP gas is. The actual building was still Benson's little store there. And um, the gal and her husband that ran it, when a call came in, they would get a call from, the t at the time it was Ramsey County was dispatching, would give them a call, they would go on a call tree, they would hit <laughs> one number and everybody who was on the department's phone would ring and whether their wife or whoever would pick it up and it would give them the address. And uh, that's, that's how it, it, really, it really started. So then as time progressed a little bit, they had a siren, like a, a tornado siren, that if you were outside in your yard or you needed to, that thing would go off and you knew it was something you needed to, you'd get in your car and respond to the station. And then probably, well, I think it, we were with pagers of probably when I started in 77, and you wore a pager. So about 43 years, you wore this pager, just a little smaller than your cell phone is today. And that would alert you then that there was a call. And actually, as time progressed, it would not only alert you, but it would also give you the address and what type of call it was. Yeah, it got me in trouble quite a few times. <laughs> I left Ma at the grocery store. <clears throat> I've, I've, I've when no, when Nolan's burned. <laughs> I've done worse. <laughs> so. And I got over to Gladstone, and that's where I stayed. <laughs> yeah. So if we want to just, uh, we can we kind of do a little tour. And Whichever way you want to start. I will go in this way first. And, and get well, real quick, too, before you go in so you see it. So that office that you see on the right when you walk in, that was actually the district chief. So each station had a district chief, and then each department had assistant chief, and then they had the chief. So the, each station had a chief who was in charge, but it was a district chief. So in here was just nothing more than a meeting room. It wasn't until about 2015 that we added these two dorm rooms because we had two firefighters staying here around the clock. And so we added those at that time to do it. One of the things, as Mike just mentioned, that is the original tile that was there. This carpeting and that tile was later. But even worse, if you want to believe this, all that wood paneling you see is the original wood paneling. <laughs> So, and if you look into the kitchen, other than the appliances, that is everything that's in there is exactly what was there when the station was built. And we've, we've re replaced quite a few appliances over the years, but that stuff has all been original that was there. So, this so the firefighters that are here, what are they responsible for doing when they're in here, when they're in their, for their shift for that 24 hours. Yep, so first of all, what they do in the morning, a real quick thing that they do in the morning is they go through every truck and every ambulance, make sure it's stocked properly, everything is operational and functional. So they pull it out on, they run a little water, they make sure everything's operational. And then they have their internal duties, make sure the place is cleaned, put everything where it needs to be, you know, and those types of things, plus take the calls that they need to take. So what we ran out of here was one engine and an ambulance and two people. And those two then went be between the ambulance and the fire truck, which was whatever was needed. And so they, they were quite busy when you, two people are doing both duties like that. So then basically did that. They had study time if they were taking classes that they had here. And then also we gave them a little bit of downtime, but they would have their lunch. And their lunch could be anywhere starting at 11 o'clock, and they may not get to lunch till 2 or 3 o'clock or even 4 o'clock, or they might not get it at all, depending on how the call volume is. 
So then they do a little, we, we try to make sure that they get a little workout in. Having them physically fit is very important. Um, so we get them to try to get them to do a little bit at whether it was running around the station a little bit as years went along We got some equipment out in the bay that they could use a little bit And then usually after about five or six o'clock unless there were PR events We, we, we kind of let them have their rest time and so uh, usually no we we kind of said nobody hits the hits the, the racks until about nine o'clock and um, But again as calls came in they would take those calls so these two dorm rooms that were here were added as well um, but the area that you have, this here, nothing else was done to this other than, as Mike mentioned, under this carpet, I believe, is still that old floor that's in there. Any questions? Yeah, it was. It isn't insulated very well, trust me. How do you know how many guys are going to run? Somebody calls in and says they got a fire in their kitchen. How do you know? Do you call up? About 30 guys or just yep. one of those guys? So when you go back into the, the days that it was paid for a call, that's exactly what happened. If we, we got a call for a fire, was everybody responded. And then if whoever was here first, the first five or six would get on the truck to go, the next five or six would get on the second truck and go, and we had other stations that were responding to that area as well, and they would do the same thing. And, and today we kind of do it the same way, except we kind of modernized it a lot, is that based on the type of a call it is, it determines, the CAD will determine what stations to notify, whether it, of any of them that we have, what stations to notify and what equipment should be sent. So it's really modernized it a lot and made it much more efficient as well. Do you work with other cities? We Most do. We, we, yep. Football? Yep. So early days, as, as, as he can remember, um, it was... Mutual aid is what we had, yeah. and mutual aid was is is that it, we would help anyone within our even White Bear Lake or Little Canada. Anyone would help, but you had a call for them. So we had to get on the radio, tell Ramsey County we need mutual aid from these these stations, North St. Paul, whatever it would be. They would get toned out by the time they got there, folks. They could get there 15 to 20 minutes after we were there to get going. So about five years ago, um, we. Uh, came to and put together um, an auto aid program in Ramsey County. So today now, our city's broken up into some sections as well as the other cities, and based on the type of call it is, we will get immediately called as they will. And so the, you can get more resources to the fire much, much quicker. So if you get a call from Wright Street, you get Roseville and you Exactly, Florida. yep, exactly. And so we have it blocked off and we go into Oakdale, we go into Woodbury, they come here, we go into, into Little Canada, into White Bear Lake. And we have this great working agreement. The other thing that's really good is over time is that we're all following the same protocols. We're all following the same type of strategies that we use. And the command system that we use is all the same throughout Ramsey County. And that has been a, a real special thing. The other thing that we've done probably in the last three years is what we call closest uh, response. And what that does is, is based on, now that we have GPS in our CAD system, which is our dispatching system, they can tell you who the closest engine is, who the closest chief car is, who the closest ambulance is. So for structure fires and cardiac arrest, the closest unit, no matter what city it's in or where it's at, is automatically dispatched at the same time that the city that it's in is to get that to it. And that has made many, we've had great saves because of that uh, with cardiac arrests and even some great saves with house fires. And that includes St. Paul. I mean, St. Paul comes in here quite a bit and we go into St. Paul quite a bit on those same types of, with using that, uh, that call system. <laughs> Close at unit dispatching is what we actually call it. Are the police going to work out of this one? When you... No, we, police PD is not going to have an a, a, um, a office here, no. Okay. Well, was it a substation they call it? Yep, yep. They, they are still down using ones, but they, they don't utilize. They won't use the one here because they're so close out of the, the, fraud, or the main office down there. Mm -hmm. Do you have a lot of people that want to be firemen? Well, and if so, like, what kind of training do they have to undergo? So if you go back when I started, it wasn't a lot of training. It was more OJT, on-the-job training, is what it was. <laughs> there wasn't a lot of formal training. So it wasn't until about the early 80s that there was actually formal training that was put together. And it was you needed to have Firefighter 1, Firefighter 2, and that was the state courses that were taken. 
So early on in my stage, it was hard to get onto a department because they had so many people who wanted to be a part of it. As time went on, and as I mentioned, we, we didn't have the resources that we had, it became more and more difficult to get people to do it. So if you speed everything up from today, that's kind of what got us to where we are today with full-time staff. And pretty much, I would say by the end of 25, if not much earlier, pretty much every fire department in Ramsey County will have, will be full-time staffing. If not, at least a combination of full-time and part-time staffing um, to do that. So, and then as of today though, yes, you right now when we put out an application for someone, we probably get 30 or 40 applicants for a job. Well, young kids today, which is really great, want to be firefighters. And we have something to offer that a lot of the other departments don't, and that is the paramedic program back in 2005 was moved over from the police department who started it in early 77, or early 70s. Um, we took that over because it was funny. Back then, the police could do it because their call volume wasn't as big. But as their police call volume went up, the, and, the, and the medical calls went up because the city was growing, they couldn't manage both of them. And so what a better place to put it was into the fire department and we could manage our calls. And today, what we're really thankful for is because of all of the fire prevention and all the things we give to the young kids and that, um, what we've really is is that our fires are starting to decrease pretty significantly. And again, with sprinklers in so many of the buildings we have and such, that is gone, but yet our medical calls are continuing to rise. So our level, you know, is still there and we're still able to manage it very well. Yeah, when they started that medic program, they basically played each fire station amongst each other. Well, if you don't take it, parts I didn't take it, Gladstone was going to come over, and it was, mm -hmm. so it took us four votes, we got it. Once the guys got interested in it, I think they would have gone even farther. And I don't know how it was up here. If they, no, we all we all bought into every matter of fact uh, we even put on special classes to get all of our firefighters EMTs so that we could work right alongside of the paramedics at the time doing some of the and helping them and doing roles. And that was a great process. That worked 20 years, that worked fantastic, if not longer. That was a fantastic way to provide both ambulance and EMS services. Because if you remember going back into the early 70s into the 60s, there there really wasn't an ambulance service. The police would show up barely and not even trained and they'd pick you up they'd throw you in the back of the of the station wagon which is what it was and away you went to the nearest hospital so at that time actually uh, Dennis Cusick uh, was the one who started that program he was a lieutenant in the Maplewood Police Department and Dennis started that program and, and kept it going over the years so back to where those are the two rooms uh, there's nothing about the size that matters to anything we just put up two rooms quick that we needed to do it. Um, used to be when this the meeting room, that this was the head of the table was here. That's where the bosses sat and ran the meetings. And um, What day did you close this down? Well, well, May, last week? Just uh, to the end of May. Oh. Yeah, so, oh yeah, they just moved out probably a week ago. Oh, yeah. The dust yeah. doesn't even settle. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Chase, one of the firefighters out here, I know, I saw that. I gotta figure out which one it was. So as you go back, here's the same tile, but what the really we really laugh about a lot is when you look into the bathrooms, that green tile and everything oh, is green. Gee. That is original from day one, and none of us could figure out who picked that, that color Steve? out. No, we never did change it. It was yeah. useful. And then the gal's bathroom and that and a shower was back over in that way there. And then obviously we had we're in that closet there is where we had our, our washer and dryer in there. So this was the area we would go out quite a bit too when the calls came in. Half the room would go this way because it was always to see who could get on the truck first because that's where the action was and that's where you wanted to be. So as quickly as you could get out this way or the other way. Yeah, so that's the garage that you were just in so we can head back that way. Okay. How many female firefighters? Today we, today, have? Yeah, over the course of the years, even when we were paid for calls, we averaged two to three. Yep, and today now we actually we have two firefighters, um, two veteran firefighters that are gals. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. And they do as great a job as any of our oh. firefighters. They, they, they have to pass all the mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, they had to do everything we did. Yep, absolutely. All the classes that a man would take, they mm -hmm. had to take. Yep. So one of the things that... 
pretty much every fire station ever built, and they still do build them, but not as much as they used to do it, was the hose tower. And when after you came back from a fire, because at the time a lot of it was a canvas type thing, and it needed to the outer shell, and it needed to dry out, so you would get a guy that'd climb up the ladder there, and then you inside the hose tower here, and then you would hook a strap around it, you'd pull that hose up, and you'd hang it over these big pipes, and it would sit in there and dry out for three or four days. And then when you need it again, you constantly had good dry hose and had to do it. But that was the hose tower. You don't see a lot of those today for two reasons. It's, uh, it's, it is dangerous, and so a lot of folks don't want them. The other thing is, is that we can dry our hoses and our stuff much more quicker with actually hose dryers. And it's just a machine that sets up and you throw the hose in there and it dries it. So it's much more efficient too as well. Yeah, you always had to flip a coin to see who wanted to go up there because once you were up there, you were the guy that had to have the muscles because you were pulling 8 or 10 or 12 sections of hose and each one of those sections probably weighed about 45 pounds. We did, but you still had to be the guy on top that was pulling. So. Yeah. so anyways, one of the things you'll always find in early fire stations, there's never enough room for storage. And that was one of the big issues that we had here too. So we actually only had three rooms out here for storage. One of them, as you can see there, took up the big blue air compressor, which is what provided air to the trucks and things through the whole piping here. And the other one there, way into the back that you see, that's the SCBA compressor. That's where we filled up our SCBAs. And those were the bottles that we put on our back that we would go into the fires with. So that took up one room. The next room, you had to have a tool room. You had to have a place for tools. That was the next room you had there, and there wasn't much size to that. And then the last one down there you had is where we stored our EMS equipment. Other than that, pretty not much of anything else. So what do you put into a new fire station that you don't have here that's really important? So a couple of things that we do now is that you need to have an area which is, a, which is what we call a cold zone. So in other words, because of the carcinogens that a fire puts out today, and a lot of uh, firefighters who uh, have been afflicted with the cancers, um, stations now are set up where the, the, when you pull your truck into the bay, it's considered the hot zone. So before you take anything off, you go into a, 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 a medium type zone, you get all of your stuff off and that, all the air is held within that area, you would get that off, it would then get washed and everything, you would go and shower and you would come back. So there's, there's three different tiers that you would go until you hit the cold zone. And so those are areas that are taking up a lot more space now in a fire station than they ever did before. And it all has to do with firefighter safety. Um, storage rooms and that are, are, there's more, but the biggest thing is, is the fact with the carcinogens that fires produce, having that hot zone that you get everything off on, and then taking it in, getting it all off, getting it cleaned, and then you get cleaned and then being able to put it back. That's kind of the progression that you'll see what we do. The other thing that's new that this station never had either is that it's called positive pressure. So anything that is out here eventually probably migrated its way a little bit into the main meeting rooms in that area as it did in any of the fire stations built back when this was done. Today, that can't happen because they're designed to have positive pressure. So nothing can go in. So the main area where they sleep, where they eat, they live, all of our offices are at, that's positive pressure. And they're holding all those carcinogens and that other air outside of those rooms and keeping it into this bay. The other thing that we only had in here to actually eliminate any of the diesel fumes and smoke we had is that one big tall metal thing in the corner back there is a chute. And then these shutters would open up. Air would get sucked in through those shutters. And then those, there's a fan that would kick in and it would try to suck those things out. And to be honest with you, I don't know if it ever had any value to it or not, but that was the only thing we had at the time. So if you go down to station one that we have down there, um, one of the things that we had there was right now we have a huge, you'll see it up in the ceiling, a huge EVAC. And what that does is, is it senses the amount of uh, CO and the amount of fumes that are in there. That will kick on, and in within a matter of about three minutes, it can clear that whole, that whole bay area down there. And then new fresh air is brought in to fill it. That was a very good, very good question, Mike. Thank you. Yeah, there's, there's some really significant changes to what it takes. And costs obviously go along with it to make a station today that can keep your firefighters, and actually anybody using the stations, much safer than we ever did before. Do the firefighters have to take uh, a continued education? We sure do. Um, we're required in order to keep our firefighter certificate, or actually our license today because it changed to a license. In order to do that, 
we have to have about, in a three-year period, we have to have about 75 hours of continuing ed. That, that, is, that is just for the fire side. Then you have the medical side of it, which is even more that you have to do it. Yep. That's a lot. Yep. And it's certain course, certain things that you have to take in order to have that happen. You yeah. mentioned it too with that uh, prodigium um, uh, on Century, uh, that new uh, training facility. Yep. So that was something that actually Chief Anderson and I put our heads together and got that going. That was probably one of the greatest things that ever happened to the east side of St. Paul or the east side of, of uh, Ramsey County uh, for fire service. And uh, that has been a great asset to use. Century Colleges uses it dramatically. So many new people are trained. The other thing that really made that, that worthwhile was the fact that um, <coughs> before, in order to really get training done, you had to already be on a fire department. And today now, Century College offers us classes that you don't have to be. So when we start looking for people to hire, all of them now, we require them to be a minimum of a paramedic and a minimum of a firefighter too with some hazardous material operations training in order to apply. So it, it's been a great asset for everybody on, even in Washington County, everybody on this side yeah, of town. We live by there every time we drive by sometimes you see those windows open, the smoke coming out. Yep. People running around. One building, the one furthest to the back, it's all fake smoke and that's all done through propane, the flames and the fire that we put in there and we can push a button and that all goes out and then the building in front with the high tower on it that's actually all live all live fires what? live fires that we put in there oh, really? mm -hmm. so the three bays we had the back bay door that you have there that didn't come like we mentioned into the probably late 70s or so early uh, 80s um, and we did that because that sometimes we, we had to store the big ladder truck and that ladder truck almost went tip to tip on that whole bay and um, as the trucks got bigger, it was funny. So a quick, quick, funny story. Down at Gladstone, uh, a truck was bought. They put it together. A team was put together. They got it. It was built. Everybody was excited. They got to drive it in. They were going to back it into the fire station. It was too tall. So they had to make some changes to the door. They had to cut a little bit of the door off of the you know, ledge out. And, and that wasn't uncommon. That happened a lot because you never thought about the fact of what these, how the trucks were getting so much bigger and bigger. I remember that. Back in our one, 139 end, we had to make sure we were in one of the high bays because we were taking all the lakes off. Yeah. And our last 136, when they did that one, they had to walk, they had, they told them they had to walk Joel six foot out in front of the hill in the wintertime. Any other questions? But pretty much what you see in this bay was exactly it. Kind of the outline that you see over there were those red gear lockers. Everybody had their own gear, and that was outside here. That's the other big thing you won't see anymore. You won't see it at the news station is none of the gear will be inside the bays. It'll be in another room that has positive pressure because it goes in because if they sit out here like they have been, they get contaminated every time a truck starts up. Is there any problem with um, contaminated waste? No, we really don't. Anything we do that we would have would be taken care of um, through the washing. Are you talking about like washing the, the gear and that? Or? Well, I'm just thinking if you're bringing all this contamination on your body and your truck, is it in the ground? Yep. No, what you do is most of it gets washed and it goes down. Once you wash it off in that and you get it with water and you get it out of your pores of your skin, that's one of the biggest things. You get it out, it just goes down and it's, it's done. Yep. I can't say that for everything, but at least for what we do, that pretty much we're known to be covered or good. What's the new station going to look like in terms of orientation and how many bays are going to be in it and how many, where are people going to live when they're here? So what you see now will actually be a part of the fire station and um, the distance going that direction will probably be moved back three or four feet. We're going to definitely go back farther that way. We need the bays are going to be much longer. These are only about 40 foot bays. The new ones are going to be, I think, 70 foot bays. So we can get more than one piece of equipment in there back to back. Doors will go through. They'll be drive through. So all of the seven bays that Mike mentioned will be facing to the north. And then you'll come in from Hazelwood over here. You'll come through a drive around. There'll be identical seven bays back here. And you will drive your stuff in and go that way. 
And so then, probably from where a bob is standing on back, will all end up being storage type rooms. It's going to be some of the cleaning areas, that type of a thing. And the building probably won't go any more to the west than what currently is there. It may be a hair, but I, don't, I think it's pretty much where it is. Then going to the east out here, then after the seven bays, will be a two-story building. The bottom half will be the administrative offices. Um, it will have the, uh, as Mike mentioned earlier, it'll have a meeting area, it'll have a community type room that's there, and of course bathrooms, and then it'll have a command area, a watch area, those types of things. And directly above it then, there will be, uh, that will be the housing for the firefighters. They'll have their dorm room, their kitchen, their day room up there, they'll have their uh, laundry room stuff that's all to be up there for them. So in other words, they'll be self-contained in that area that's up above there. One of the real nice things is, is that there'll be a, a garage that'll go out to the side for the chief's vehicles, and above that garage there is going to be a nice, beautiful workout area. Something we've never had, as you can see, well, you don't, can't see it now, but you know, workout stuff used to be over there in the corner, and it's hard to do it when it's not air conditioned and it's a day like this. So um, that'll all be up there, and that's going to be great for them, um, and they're excited. Um, a lot of new technology that will go into the, to the new station that we're doing. And uh, I can tell you that uh, there'll be a lot more storage than we've ever had before. So. What? Nope, there will be no pole in it. Yep, so the biggest truck we have uh, is about uh, 44 feet, somewhere in that length. And the radius as this comes in, we have it set up so that we could make it into the very first bay as we turn in. It won't be, I mean, anything can happen. And I'm not in on all of as much as I was earlier. If we were talking about moving it into the second bay, so the radiuses are all being determined and set, and we can do that. So then you have that, the parking will be the main entrance of the station, will be facing the west over there. That's where everybody will come in to the main vestibule. The offices will be more to the south side of the station. The big meeting room and that will be more to the north side. And then in the back you'll have some breakout rooms and then you'll have some of the uh, offices for the captains and the places for the firefighters to study. How many are going to be able to sleep here? We're setting this up for I want to say, oh man, what was it? We set up 10 down at station. I think we're setting it up for 14. I could be wrong. I just don't quite remember. Because we got a plan for the future. Because you can't get yourself into a situation like we have here where you just can't do anymore. So we're planning for the future and what there'll be. And I, I think, too, is that, you know, as we are now, there, there'll be over the next maybe 10 years some additions. But we're getting to the point where the number of our firefighters that we need should carry us for well over the length of that station. If you, you look at what we're in, even this Gladstone station that we have now, at the time that we bu were building it, it's when I was the chief, just became chief there, um, we did a referendum. And the referendum was for X amount of dollars, and you can't change that amount. And so all of a sudden, pricing was so high, construction was so bad that we had to cut a lot of, uh, out of it. So when we built that station, and we had to cut, so it was kind of bare bones. And so. And you look at station one down there, we're trying to comp uh, copy a lot of what we have there because it's worked so well, bringing it into this. Other than the design is going to look way more modern. It's going to be very nice. Um, it's got a lot of good lines that are going to be with it, a lot of good coloring to it. And um, I, I think it's going to be a beautiful station. Um, it's going to be so efficient. I mean, you've, you've got heaters in here that right now do it. We're going with all in-floor heating like we have down at station one. It's so efficient and it works so well. Uh, it dries your equipment much quicker you're, and everything that you have. It keeps the trucks from rusting because you have the heat coming up. It takes all that snow and stuff. It melts it much quicker. And uh, so it, it, it is a much better spot. So to say we've digressed in that, the answer is no. We've only moved forward. Walking around, but I, I think it's a it's a compelling story about the fire service and um, it, the, the past builds into the future, and I think it's it's a really exciting opportunity. And um, the new fire station is going to be uh, the budget is thirteen point one million dollars. It's going to come in at a little bit under that, about twelve point seven, twelve point eight million. Uh, Krauss Anderson will be the construction manager. Um, and it's going to be fast. I mean, if you think about how quick the last year was, uh, a year goes by really quick. So it should be a really exciting kind of uh, change. So.
Thanks for All the right. tour, everybody. Here's, a, here's a, one suggestion I have. Maybe like three times, four times a year, we could meet at a place that has heritage worth preserving mm -hmm. and get the same treatment. Find somebody who knows 80 years of history and mm -hmm. you know I think it would be interesting to get into the community more and learn more about different spaces because I thought this was super valuable. So. Well, when we, I was on the fire department before St. John's was built. We had a mock airplane crash nice. in the morning. We all came back here to eat lunch and the tones went off and it was, we had a parade of fire trucks <laughs> all the way down to 3M building an oven fire. <laughs> okay, Fire Maplewood, uh, uh, Hazelwood Fire Station history, that's good. Now we're going to move on to uh, Heritage Preservation Award. Uh, Mike? Yeah, got? thanks uh, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, so the uh, uh, HPC puts together the, the Maplewood Heritage Award and we are, um, every year we get applications for people who might be recognized. If you remember last year, um, the 2019 winner was Gary Bastian. We have yet to have an in-person meeting, so we have not given him the award yet. Um, but our plan after our discussion of last meeting was to have uh, we'll identify who has been nominated in the past, identify new people we want to potentially nominate, and then give the 2019 and 2020 award presentation to the city council at the same time. And so I looked through our records and the two names of people that we have on file for uh, previous nominations is Janice Quick and Bob Overby. Bob is not one. I looked, I went and looked at the plaque in the city council chambers just to make sure. Uh, so those are the two nominations we have in hand. Any member, of the community or of this group can nominate somebody else. And so in your packet, I have kind of a um, purpose of the award, eligibility criteria, kind of the process for nominations. And then there's a little thing on the back about um, you would want to, how you would nominate them, uh, their name, their address, uh, phone number, we can get in touch with them. And then a little summary about who they are and why you wanted to nominate them. And I arbitrarily put a date of September 1st on the application. If this group wants to do it faster, I'm happy to do it faster. But 1st of September felt like a pretty good time frame because people can work through the summer. But this is really a chance to recognize your friends, your neighbors, leaders in the community who've done a lot of good work and put nominations forward. And so uh, I think this is a pretty good process for identifying people. What we need is you to pick who pick somebody that you think is a good winner and then once we get a number of applications in we can score them and rank them and vote and go well on. would would it be wise to pick out of two 2020 and by September 1st start thinking on 2021's application so we're not a year behind that's what I'm open. Now. So what, we, when was Gary Bastion's, what year? Gary Bastion was the 2019 winner, and it was awarded in February of 20. But we never got to present it because COVID happened. Right. So we're, st we're still holding it to have the event, and we've got the plaque, and we've got everything ready. We just need to have a city council meeting, but we've already got the next winner in rotation. So, we're going to double up our award winners. But see, that would be 19. We this, still need a 20, this, and huh? then we'll need a 21. Yeah, well, no, Gary was the 19. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> so, the 20th would have been awarded the 20th of this March of this year. Mm -hmm. So, we, we could actually take one of the two, if we wanted to put one of them in, and then by September, have our candidate for the 21. 21, yeah. And then we'd be caught up or, or not running behind time. But that's up to you guys. <clears throat> I second the motion. So the 
two people you listed are up for 20, they, they were 20? previously nominated. They were actually nominated in 2019. Okay, and they and they didn't. They weren't selected, but got we it. keep their nomination. Got it. Out. Got it. So okay. we could technically make one of those for 20 and one for 21 if it came to you it. You could, or you could nominate brand new person. Brand new person, or it's really yeah. kind of up to you how you want to do it. Do you have the writings of uh, for the, of those two candidates? Yes. Could you email them to yep. us? I sure can. So we could vote next meeting, August. Yeah. Yep. We could vote in August. We review it again next month. Yeah, okay. And then we'll vote in okay. August. So we get it emailed, we read it all, yep. review in July, vote in August. Right. September we have a ceremony to present. Right. Sounds like a good timeline to me. For all three years? For no, Gary's already got his. No, he has. He is. Well, he won. He, he won, yes. but he yeah. hasn't. He hasn't received. Received it, yet. but it, the way this is reading, he wants to present two, you know, at the same time, yeah. and that we're going I, three I, years. I feel like you're making it a lot more complicated than it needs to be. Okay, well, we'll uh, we'll take that time okay. schedule, Mike. Okay. So uh, we'll receive their applications. Review them next month and then vote for the um, for the 2020 mm -hmm. in August. Then yeah. we can take nominations in September. Yeah. Yeah. September we nominate for the 2021. Yep. All right. So we can move it along. I'm yeah. I'm tracking. And hopefully we can present it in 2021. So right. then when 22 comes, we're caught up. <laughs> no, that will have to go for 22. We usually that's usually announced in uh, January, February. It is, yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. Got it. We're just trying to get caught up a little bit. We're yeah, getting sure. caught up. Understood. Yep. Okay. There we go. Hist the historical now. Heritage Preservation Award uh, schedule is in place. Yes. Okay, let's go to old business, new member recruitment discussion. So, uh, Mr. Chair, members, we're, we are still uh, looking for two candidates for the HPC. You can reach out to friends and neighbors. I've uh, reached out to Mike Erickson and, and the Maplewood Area Historical Society to include in their uh, newsletter and email blasts about this very thing. It's going to be uh, it's on our website for people who are interested, and then it'll be in our next round of the Maplewood Living, Good. looking for people. So the, in a weird way, the paper flyer in the mail at home is almost as valuable as anything else we do because people have to touch it. Right. Some of them might put it in the recycling bin, and some of them might leave it on their kitchen counter, but um, people touch it, and I think there's some value in that. So we will hopefully get some candidates out of that. But if you know anybody... Are we hitting social media? I don't know the answer to that question, but I want... We should throw it out on Facebook at least. Okay. He works in communications. So okay. He... <laughs> <laughs> you can get the language from Do him. Do we and... have any of the previous ones that applied that we could... The most recent applicant that we had applied for a second commission, and she was appointed to that one. She was well, a and I believe it was Hitsy. What about former members? I know well, no, off. The one that, uh, when Margaret got on, there was one there. Oh, there. I, I'll, I can, we can go back to old applicants. Right. And, and, you know. Or old members, Old even, members, too. That their term expired and they took off, maybe they're willing to come back. Okay. That's good. Okay. Well, we're looking for two, so let, okay. let spread the word. Okay, let's move on to St. Paul Regional Water Project discussion. So I uh, printed out some slides uh, for those who don't have them, and if you can, uh, you got, you've got one. Kind of cut off, but I got it, yeah. You sent this out. I did, I sent this out on the email, but I said I was going to have it available for printing. Um, so we had a presentation from the uh, St. Paul Regional Water Services um, staff to talk about their project. Um, the conversation included folks from the State Historic Preservation Office, Ramsey County Historical Society, Maplewood Area Historical Society. I know, Bob, I think you were on the call as well. It was a Zoom call. And what they really did is they wanted to identify who their partners were, um, who they wanted to include in the kind of the conversation. 
and really just to talk through what they're going to do. And it is a, it's a very old plant, and if you're familiar with the, I'll call it the easternmost portion or the kind of the back of the, of the area, there's the big tanks, and then there's all of the underground subterranean piping and materials. That's the bulk of what they're going to be replacing. A couple of years ago, we, the, the group, the ones that were here, we took a tour. Mm -hmm. They took us through the whole plant. That, Interesting. That's something that we're willing to do again. Um, and they've actually made that offer to kind of come out and, and show us what they're going to do. Um, the, the proposed demolitions are the two subterranean structures um, it's just it's essentially where they where the dirtiest of the water starts um, There's one above a ground structure from 1938 that they're gonna have to tear down. It was almost like an addition to the original uh, Structure and then a small 1950s uh, Piece of infrastructure that they're gonna tear down and then the round clarifiers the kind of the big circular I got clicky there. Why couldn't they? <coughs> And it probably won't work, but gut them and put all the new stuff in it and leave the foundation because they're structural damaged. I, yeah. Because it, they're going to put four of them up. Mm -hmm. That would save two building two, two new ones. You could almost say that they're going to demolish everything. Well, from the back half, certainly. Yeah. 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 Uh, I don't know the in structural integrity of the. I don't know either. I just, yeah. I just got thinking. You know, when yeah. you look at the new yeah. and old. This is the only thing. I don't know if that's going to be good. Okay. So the main, the the sort of the the main front of the building, the kind of what you're, what yes. the most prominent piece is yes. going to remain. Yes. Yes. That's new. <laughs> that's new. Um, they did talk quite a bit about wanting to preserve the history, and so they are going to make a book. A coffee table book uh, about documenting the history and um, potential h historic documentation efforts so they're going to do a coffee table book with photos and writing they're going to do a video documentary with interviews of the current staff and former staff um, if you if you're familiar <coughs> with Ken Burns the guy who made the Civil War story they're going to kind of do it that way where they'll have some narrative and some pictures and it'll kind of look really nice um, I think the other, the only thing I, I guess I'll add is they did offer to have um, us on a tour, and then they also are going to have um, the HPC as kind of a coordinating agency. So the state the historic preservation office will manage the process in consultation and coordination with us and Ramsey County. So it's kind of a three-part piece um, because I think they they recognize after the story in the paper that it was an important part of the history, and so. Uh, I think they got the message and want to be more inclusive of kind of what that looks like. When is all this going to start? They are still 2024 start. Oh, that's, they're pretty far out. Yeah, yeah they're, the planning phases and the engineering phases of this is, is complicated, so they're not going to start until 2024. So we've got time for our tour. They'll have time for <laughs> <Yeah>. our tour. <laughs> yeah. It was a very interesting meeting. I don't know who. I was on that Zoom call. Too. Okay. Well, I was I was there too, but on the computer would know. We will talk about the computer. <laughs> so we'll, we'll send a fax next time for you. Will Minkhouse is the project coordinator, and, and he's been uh, willing to kind of do everything, and he's the one who put this packet of materials together. Okay. okay. Good. Very good. Good. Okay. Next is uh, HPC annual report. So we, one of our duties as an HPC is to file an annual report with the uh, with our state office partners. The background history on this is the last time the annual report was submitted was 2018. So we have a little bit of catching up to do. Um, the good news is, is we have the template and the formatting for this. Uh, I've started kind of laying out what it looks like. And so by, at our next meeting, we're going to have a draft copy to start to begin editing and getting that ready Great. to submit. Um, it's been a journey in the last year, um, but we're, we're ready to, uh, to 
clean up the past, no pun intended, and kind of move forward going along. So I think for the annual report, the intent is to make it a brochure style, try to keep it to eight pages. What the one thing I'm looking for from this group, aside from our statutory duties, what are some of the interesting kind of little projects that have come up in the last two years that you think we ought to highlight more, if anything? And I'll open it up to the group to kind of say, make sure you include. Well, I thought that uh, the cemetery okay. up by the, by the park farm. The uh, poor farm? What? The um, the cemetery to stop away from heaven. Okay. okay. The poor yeah. farm? Yeah. The uh, we did County look, Fair site. Yeah, we did look at that and yeah. gone over it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That and the Ramsey County barn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Six up. What else would happen? Well, and I think uh, the Lookout Park. Lookout Park sign. Yep. Uh, yeah. The improvements out at the Brood Trump Farm. Mm -hmm. yeah. We still got to have a fifth one bailey on that. <laughs> the ribbon cutting? Right. We talked about it. The painting of the doors <laughs> at the <laughs> barn. <laughs> The original doors, yeah. Oh. We read a book about how much we discussed that yeah. deal. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys were doing overtime on that oh thing. Oh, my goodness. You know, that one hurt to have a tour of the farm. Okay. You know, the, uh, yeah. the Rams County farm. Mm -hmm. Let's have a meeting out there one time. Yeah, yeah. Do it like we did here. Yeah. Yeah, they claim they're not going to use the upper part because they yeah. didn't put a ramp or whatever back up. It. Yeah. Yeah. I went out there and that ramp looked just fine to me. So the other pieces that I think we'll touch on is the role that we played on the um, the section 106 review of the of the BRT, uh, the work that Pete did and, and Bob Jensen did on the old rail beds and those kinds of things. Yeah, we're still working. I think we're yeah, still working. Yeah, but I think we want to include that, that in the end of Included, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It's, work's been done, so it's yep. worth noting. Um, and that, that leads me to my next piece. So we have next, uh, in July, we're going to have Steve Love do a presentation on the, um, kind of where we're at in terms of the project development of the, of the, of the line. So, um, Bob was just telling me tonight that he thinks that where they're digging over there, they might have gone into the 1800 rail bed. Sure, it looks close, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Are we going to be at City Hall next month? We're going to be at City Hall in person, live. Nice. Mm -hmm. On camera. Cool. Has council already started that? No. So we are actually pre council pre because the way the oh. calendar goes. <laughs> nice. Uh, we're the Thursday before their meeting, so. <laughs> to rechristen the board. <laughs> it'll be it'll be great to come back in yeah. person. Oh, um, for sure. Yes, hundred percent better. So that list that you were talking about—that's stuff we you that's want stuff to do. With stuff, it's, it's both stuff we've worked on, and then the things that we're that are always going to be on our work plan. So if you have anything else, we what would, do people think about the original city hall? Putting that on. The That's the one that's going to be torn down. Um, well, that building, no, that I meant the Filipino the, the Center, Center was also City Hall at one time. Yeah, yeah, but the, the one that they're tearing down was the, the original, original. Yeah. original, original, yeah. yeah. I should say the second, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that uh, that had a lot of years, so yeah. Plus they've done it. some improvements to it, so well, it might have. be something that you want to check out. Plus the uh, police emergency sign is still there. They just painted it white, but you can see police department. Oh, really? oh right? in, the, in the back? Mm -hmm. yep, I know Where you go down about. into the, yep. the jail? Yes. The jail is still down there. Yes. Yeah, that would be interesting. It'd be worth a tour almost. Yeah. Well, a lot of touring coming up. A lot of people don't realize that they, they do um, dual um, citizenship there. Get your passport and all kinds of things. Oh, really? mm -hmm. Yep. 
Yeah. City Hall used to be part of uh, the Gladstone Station too at one point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when, in terms of the annual report, um, it's hard to write as a group, so I'm, I'm happy to put it together and then have it kind of finishing touches, yeah. if that's okay. The, that's other, wise, the yeah. other thing that can be added in there is we went through a year of uh, the pandemic. Mm. <laughs> I think everybody's annual report yeah. kind of mentioned that. <laughs> <laughs> well. It, it's something I've never thought about doing before. Well, it'll be part right. of our heritage I mean, sooner rather than later. Our great, great grandchildren will read about it. Right, yeah. right. So, uh, which is great. Um, so I've heard a couple of times people like this tour and they like getting out. Um, how many times a year do you think it's appropriate to get out into the community to get a kind of a, a deep dive into an area? Well, maybe two. <laughs> two or three. I was thinking quarterly. Maybe okay. that's too much. I don't that's know. Probably a little too much. Okay. Yeah. Depends on what's coming. What. The city yeah. decides to throw at At them. least two. Okay. At least two. Yeah, I'd say two minimum is a good. Yeah. So maybe yeah. the St. Paul Regional Water. Yeah. Um, uh, tour of the farm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, yep. the Ramsey. Yeah. Right. And then space them out by do one, not on the hottest day of the year, but maybe, <laughs> maybe one in the fall. Yeah. October yeah. time, maybe. Yeah. September, Even the October. Trip farm. Yeah. Plus. Depends on what the planning commission does. They sometimes will have a tour of all the new stuff that they've approved. Mm -hmm. Well, and I was going to say the uh, you'll notice the construction equipment just over there. The property owner just pulled their building permit this week for construction of multifamily housing. So this stretch of road is going to get a lot of. Where's the multifamily? Um, just on the other side of the community garden. Okay. If you, so it's if, owned by the church. If you, if you came from this way, you'd see it. But if you go out that way, it's worth looking at because yeah. they're putting up a new uh, senior um, apartment housing. Okay. And yep. the church is probably the contractor. Church is the sponsor. Okay. They own the. Yep. They Are they going to own the housing too? Yeah. The, uh, the church. Well? That's what uh, Bob was saying. That where they're digging, it's they might have hit the old rail bed in there. Yeah, close. Okay. So there's a lot of change on along this stretch. All so right. I think that that water, um, St. Paul Water Works, I think that could be put off a little bit. Okay. Well, yeah, since we got till 24. Yeah. <laughs> yeah maybe the farm would be the thing to look okay. at right now. Yeah. And, Ball, and, the, and the cemetery there. Yeah, because they're not going to have a Ramsey County Fair this year. Oh, they aren't. They're nope. Not? Nope. The uh, from what. Uh, my sources from Bob Pletcher said that the city police department will not do the security around it. Oh, I thought that was about the state fair. He no. talked about that. The Bob Pletcher is in charge of the fair. Yeah. He's trying to get help for that. Yeah. But the county fair, Maple had said that they wouldn't do the, the security for it. Huh. Huh. So they're not going to have the Ramsey County Fair this year. Okay, that uh, takes care of the annual report. Maplewood Area Historical Society update. Bob Jensen left, but I think we could look at just what's on the calendar to mention a few things. Yeah, you're on the board. Well, this week is the uh, tea huh? on Saturday. And then I don't know if this is a Maplewood Historical Society thing, but um, Mary is going to have a, it's called the Cowboy Dinner and Dance on October yeah, that 3rd. Yeah, that wouldn't be anything. And, uh, no, I think uh, I've got it here. So we are June 10th. So Dairy Day, Dairy Day in uh, Maplewood Area Historical Society is going to be on Thursday, June 24th, which is 
two weeks. Is that two weeks? 24th? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And that's from four to eight. And then the next big one would be in August, the Johnny Appleseed Day. That would be Sunday, August 29th. And that would be from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. And then we have the fall big red barn sale and that would be Saturday, September 11th. And that would be from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. What are they what are they doing for Dairy Day? Uh, I mean, obviously come celebrating there, dairy, they, but yeah, that, uh, actually they're having a Dairy Queen. Oh, really? Yeah, she's going to be there oh, from the state there. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah, I'll have uh, to stop out. Yeah, and then they show you how they make milk and Is that and the brew trip? Right. Deal? Right over there. Yeah. Be a good visit. That's two weeks from let's see, that's uh 24th. So yep. Thursday the 24th. 8 uh, 4 to 8. I've never actually been there. We'll okay. be driven through. Well, all right. You had an Easter deal where you drove through and they yeah. handed you out through yeah. your window, but that's the only yeah. time I've been there. Yeah. Bob, what did you decide on the uh, executive vault? Isn't there an event on the 17th? Uh, yeah, that's for the um, Lake Bear. Uh, oh, that's not for Maplewood Historical? No. Oh, okay. it, it's so Well, it's a White Bear Chamber of Commerce that's going to visit. Okay, gotcha. What did they? Do, what did the board decide on the uh, executive committee or person that there's? Uh, they, they're uh, looking at making a permanent director or hiring a permanent director, and that would be on their website. Let's get a look at the website. So the board approved it on Monday. Yes. Okay. Commission presentations. Anybody have anything they want to go along the meeting with? <laughs> well, go out to Hazelwood Park for the 4th of July. The fireworks? Yeah. The fireworks. No food trucks, no grilling, but they'll have fireworks. We're one of the only communities in the East Metro doing fireworks. I noticed yeah. that everything's canceled. Minneapolis so. isn't doing them. St. Still Paul's water. not doing them. Still water's not doing them. And we're going to be it. So. Yep. So I've been telling everybody. So people do a Google search for Minnesota fireworks. They're going to see Maplewood only, and we're going to be packed to the so hill. We would average about <laughs> eight to ten thousand. We're expecting another probably ten to twelve. Oh, I believe oh, yeah. it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Just put it on Zoom. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> get down there a few hours early. It could be a hybrid. And it is, a, I believe it's a Sunday this year. Oh. Yep. So okay. it'll, a lot of yeah. folks will be, oh, yeah. have the whole day. Yeah. And it will get more volume than what we had thought oh, yeah. before. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, one of the things I'll just add is that um, Jason sent a message over to Chad or to the city about um, documenting Steve Lucan's history. And we have an, uh, an answer to your question already. Oh wow! Back in 2013, Steve Lucan gave an interview. Uh, it's a recorded oral history of the fire department. Nice. 93 pages. Wow. Based on what I just my little clicking of the button. So, um, I think we're. That was my exact. That was his exact so question. Was the, how do we Glad document this Glad history? Because um, he, I mean, the presentation tonight is great. And yeah. So, yeah. 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 Thank he, you. He's been around for. for he and I got on the fire department about the same time. And so many times you hear after after someone passes, man, we should have documented everything that guy knew. Well, you might as well get on it before it <laughs> comes to that time. Yeah, you know what I mean? Thanks for bringing that up, Jason. Yeah. That was good. Thanks, Mike, for finding that. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Anything else for the betterment of the Maplewood uh, uh, Heritage Preservation Commission, Nikki? Council member, thank you for well, being what's here. What's on the council agenda for us? Uh, from For historical? Yeah, what's the council going to give us? I, I can't think of anything right off the top of my head. Hmm. Um, I'm just having fun with you. The, uh, well, you got anything to give me. <laughs> well, the high V opened up. If you haven't been by the new high V, it's, it's, yeah. it's open and ready. And have you been in there? Is it pretty fancy? I went and bought lunch the first day. Nice. <laughs> I, was there at six I still got to get there. I yeah. was too. Bria, I want to see you. Hey, I was there at four thirty actually because they told me, they told me the wrong time. So. <laughs> sure, Cubs gonna feel the burn. They said there was about fifty people waiting when it opened. Oh up. yeah. 
So you didn't get a bag. I don't know if I've ever been in any Hy-Vee ever. I don't think so. It's a grocery store. Yeah. <laughs> they, could just, they just sell everything. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of everything. Move for adjournment. Anything else? Kevin, thank you for recording this. And we'll look Appreciate forward it. this to highlight our issues soon. Good. So thanks, Mike. Thank you, everybody. All right. We're adjourned. <laughs>